to the uh, Contemporary Military Forum here. My name is Eric Ocasio, so I work at USRAF uh, headquarters, the so United States Army Europe G6, uh, Director for Programs, Policy, and Projects. Uh, I'm responsible to ensure that we're uh, modernizing the network, making sure that it's robust, um, and setting the theater out east and so that way we can enable what we're going to talk about today, which is NATO convergence. Um, I'm also uh, the VP uh, for the European Region uh, for Professional Development under the General Creighton uh, W. Abrams chapter, which consecutively for seven years now, um, we have been the best overseas chapter. Oh. What's that? Oh, oh all right. Um, and, you know, we continue to strive uh, to further the legacy of enriching the lives of our military members. Uh, their families, and impacting our community within the Wiesbaden, Germany footprint. Um, our priorities are professional networking um, and development, uh, honoring our military history, soldiers, retirees, and their families, uh, and Department of Army civilians that we continue to recognize uh, day, day in and day out. Uh, one of the unique things that we, uh, we have is uh, due to our geographical location, uh, we, we can provide um, a, a great, great atmosphere for um, the folks that support the Army communities throughout Europe. Uh, so thank, thank you everyone for coming here and joining uh, this Contemporary Military Forum. Uh, the title of it today is NATO Convergence in Contact, Transforming Land Power. Um, so we, we're all here, uh, here in D.C. to converge on the Associated United States Army um, week here, and then uh, the Associated United States Army, if you don't know, is your professional association and plays a crucial role in supporting and educating Army professionals and those who support our Army. They offer a variety of forums and events throughout the year for your professional development. This being one of them, we uh, had Land PAC uh, not too long ago, and then next year we'll have Land Year. AUSA amplifies the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside and outside the Army and help further the association's mission to be the voice of the Army, support to the soldier. Of course, we can't do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story, to support our soldiers and their families, and we need a strong membership base because it's vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, and to public communities across the country through AUSA's 122 chapters within the United States and nine other countries. Who here is an AUSA member? That's quite a few. Who here is a lifetime AUSA? <laughs> oh, exactly. Uh, we thank you for your membership. For everyone else, unless you opted out of your registration, uh, <laughs> you are now a new basic, no cost, uh, member of AUSA, and we thank you as well. Um, if you're not already a premium member and would like to elevate your member benefits, uh, please uh, visit the AUSA member zone located on, at the L Street Bridge next to Hall's d &E, or you can sign up online at ausa.org slash membership. AUSA is a membership organization. We can't do it without you. You help AUSA be an effective voice of the total army and provide support for the soldier and their families. So... Um, we did this in the back, uh, but we did present a nice gift uh, to our panel members. It's a AUSA umbrella, but in the bag it looks like a bottle of alcohol. So for, for optics, so we did it in the back. Um, on behalf of General Robert Brown, AUSA's president and CEO, and the rest of the AUSA team, ACU, a, AUSA thanks these speakers with a small token of appreciation this year, and we gifted it in the back, as I mentioned. Now we'll turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Jack Watling, who is a senior research fellow, land warfare military science at Royal United States Services Institute. And before I give him the mic, um, I just, just for a PSA, uh, at the conclusion of this event, I ask that everyone have their conversations in the hallway as we do have another uh, uh, forum uh, immediately following this one. Thank you very much. Uh, so convergence was a point of discussion going back to 2017 when the U.S. Army was looking at the future operating environment, the ranges over which capabilities can now strike 
the number of sensors that you are trying to integrate at Echelon and trying to understand how you cohere and coordinate what is an increasingly complex battlefield. And at the time, the US Army was concluding that it needed to raise its sights back up from brigade, potentially to core. Uh, and some colleagues in the, in the room were working to try and work out what core level warfighting might look like uh, in applying multi-domain operations. So that's the baseline for convergence. But there's been another thing that's been converging over the last few years. Uh, earlier this year, I was in Ukraine uh, in a technical institute, and we were pulling apart two different systems. One was the KN-23 ballistic missile, uh, and the other was the Shahid-136 UAV. But while it might be called a Shahid-136, it was very different to the drones that we had been seeing in 2022 and early 2023. It was very clear that Russian technicians had been getting inside that system, rebuilding its antennas, working on the software for how it navigates, reconfiguring the warhead so it was a lot more lethal. And now we are seeing those UAVs not only being used by Iranian trainers working with the Russians, we are also seeing uh, those capabilities being used in the Middle East against other partners and allies. And now we are looking at North Korean personnel also potentially uh, moving towards the Ukrainian theater. And so what we are perceiving is a, co a convergence of threat, essentially. And if we are going to be ready to meet that increasingly complex threat, then we're not just talking about how we operate at core, but how we operate in full-scale conflict across NATO, which is a, a level of scale and complexity uh, in the multinational space that we have not previously undertaken. And so this panel, uh, which is looking at NATO convergence in contact, and I'm just going to stress briefly that point about being in contact, uh, we are seeing sabotage across Europe. You will have seen our German colleagues uh, announcing a number of instances that weren't previously public yesterday. We have had the attempted assassination of an industrial leader in Europe. We have had uh, numerous acts of arson, information operations, uh, endeavors to destabilize our political systems, and we have had Russian weapons fly through NATO airspace on their route to Ukraine multiple times. And so this is very real, uh, and it could escalate. I'm not saying it will, but the risk is there, which means that we need to be ready to fight tonight. This isn't about getting ready for some abstract future. And the panel that we've brought together today is looking at how we manage that complexity, how we work together to achieve it, and how we make sure that we are ready to deter and, if necessary, defeat threats to the alliance. And so we are going to basically run through First, my colleague Dara Massacott uh, from Carnegie is going to basically give us the J2 brief. What is the threat? What is the problem set that we are facing? General Williams, Commander US Army Europe and Africa, is then going to answer that question of what are we doing to meet that threat? And then Major General Johnny Linfors, Commander of the Swedish Army, is going to give another perspective on how European NATO allies are changing their concepts, uh, their approach to readiness, and their preparations to make sure that they can contribute to deterrence. And so with that, I will hand over to Dara uh, to kick us off. Well, thanks, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dara. And I would like to explain a very complicated phenomenon in just a few minutes. So let's see how I do this morning on 1.5 cups of coffee. Um, I am going to outline the Russian threat, and I am here in a very friendly audience to the definition of reconstitution, so I don't have to spend too much time on that. But I have had to walk people through what that means. Um, there's two different processes going on right now in the Russian military, and in particular their land power forces, the Army, um, Airborne, and the Marines. There's a short-term reconstitution process underway, sustaining the war in Ukraine. And Russia is beginning to put the pieces in place for long-term reconstitution. And I'm following that in three different areas. Uh, the procurement issue, uh, 
personnel recruiting and retention, not only during wartime, but what comes next, and proficiency. How do they retain the knowledge that they've learned in this war and, and evolve from there? And just to baseline the losses that this organization is going through and still fighting, um, open source publications have tracked since the start of the war 70,000 funerals in Russia from people fighting this, um, and around 15,000 pieces of visually destroyed equipment. U.S. government information that was released last week puts the number of KIA at 15,000 out of a total of 600,000 casualties. And the official Russian numbers, of course, remain around 5,000 um, total casualties. So they are not in a place where they are discussing these things publicly, but it is being felt in Russian society. When I started uh, my research on this, I stopped counting the deaths of officers in April of this year. And if I think about the number of lieutenants at the junior level, they've lost around 10 divisions worth of lieutenants killed. So it's an organization that is changing in real time. It is now a mobilization army. It is not the same that it was in 2022, and some of its worst impulses are being reinforced. And I'll get to that in just a moment in terms of what that means for NATO moving forward, a story that our allies in the East know all too well. So when we think about the long term, what is the Russian army going to look like after this? What is the Russian military going to look like? I'm changing. I'm good. <laughs> OK, uh, sorry. Uh, what are they going to look like after this? The future vision of the military is still coming into focus, but from what we can see already, what they've announced, what they've discussed, and different sort of military cultural issues going on inside Russia, they do plan on expanding the land power, in particular moving away from brigades and moving back into, vision, into divisions. There are several constraints that they're going to face in doing that, not least of all which is demographic and financial. But that is, that's the direction that they're moving in. And they are trying to arrange the finances for recovering from this war. We've seen them spend between 6 to 8% of their GDP on the defense budget. This is late Cold War era spending. And yet, it is still not enough to recover all of these losses. We're talking about a lump sum payment. I suspect they're trying to arrange the finances for that particular case. They have real constraints to manage in Russia. But this is a priority for them. They are simply not going to go without an army. They will rebuild it. The pace of that depends on the type of political risk that the Kremlin is willing to accept and how much inflation the population will bear. And inflation is growing rapidly. So I'd like to end my remarks on, on a basic threat assessment here, intent times capability. What does this mean for NATO moving forward? And again, if we talk about capability, most of Russia's land power is engaged in Ukraine. They are pulling the last remnants of the Soviet army out of strategic reserve in all of the locations in red that you see on the upper right corner of the map. This, this is the ghost of the Soviet army that's been in strategic reserve. 80% of what is in Ukraine now is being pulled out of these facilities. They're being emptied out. They're not empty yet, uh, but this is happening. Uh, they are learning. They are learning and adapting, and Jack has seen it up close in person. Um, they are making significant investments in drones, first-person view munitions, and other unmanned systems. The Ukrainians will tell you their electronic warfare is very good, and they are working on kinetic and non-kinetic means to defeat Western equipment that they're encountering, whether that's attackums, whether that's Gimlers, whether that's Storm Shadow. And along with that, as we move um, into what this means for NATO and beyond, there is a community of learning that is underway between Russia and its partners, Iran, North Korea, China, and all of their proxies. And we are all experiencing that right now. The knowledge that Russia gains, they pass to Iran, Iran passes to the Houthis, they shoot at our ships. Or they pass to Hezbollah, and, and now we're sending a THAAD unit into Israel to help them. So Russia is not a superpower, but they create and are creating global problems in every theater, I think, maybe minus one. So what does it mean for their intent? Their intent is to cause harm and enact revenge on everyone that is helping Ukraine right now, on top of their long-term goals um, in service of weaken weakening US leadership and undermining the rules-based international order. And we are seeing a return um, of some of the worst impulses of Russian military behavior at war. We are talking about widespread torture, systematic torture, I would say, at this point, mass rapes, murder. Um, this is a story that, that many of our, our NATO allies in the East know. What will happen 
if Russia is allowed to occupy NATO territory. These crimes against humanities and atrocities happened immediately to Ukraine. They will happen immediately again. And there are several implications for our deterrence concepts, our civil defense, and we have to act accordingly. And most troublingly for me, um, when I look out at what kind of threat actor that they think that they are, they are able to tell themselves a story that they are able to be resilient and withstand mm -hmm. NATO intelligence that we're providing to the Ukrainians, billions of dollars of lethal aid. They're telling themselves that they can defeat that. That is a type of confidence that is going into the Russian system. This is a, this is a closed system. It is hard to get them off of a track. And when they become overconfident, they do things like think that they can invade Ukraine marching in administrative columns without telling their soldiers that they're going to war. This has implications for what they think they can achieve against NATO. And right now, as Jack mentioned, they're testing us. There is a series of, um, I think, peak Cold War, if not slightly worse, set of active measures going on across Europe, whether that's assassinations, attempts, arson, um, threats against our military facilities. Just, uh, just yesterday, I think, the, the Germans spoke about an exploding package and a, a cargo hold of an aircraft, so this is very serious. And let alone all of the chaos that they are exporting to places like Africa through mercenaries. Because I would, I would assess that a lot of these soldiers that are fighting in Ukraine right now, Russian soldiers, they don't want them to return home and they will create a pipeline direct from this war into mercenary units, and then they'll be in Africa and South America too, and the Middle East. So we are looking at a, a complicated problem. They are not 10 feet tall, they are something very different. And if we don't pass the test at this level of escalation, they will keep pushing forward. And my final point is there are things that we can do to influence their behavior, and we must. They look at NATO unity and solidarity. They look at what we are doing in terms of readiness, and they look at what we're doing in terms of civil defense, and they monitor our munitions, stockpiles, and our investment into our defense industrial base very closely. And that is a way that you can get inside their OODA loop and influence their behavior. So in short, NATO words must match the deeds. And with that, I will end. Very briefly, I would just highlight that Darren mentioned the fact that money uh, is a key constraint for the Russians, uh, and that affects the politics of what they can do. But when you look at Russian defense industry, you just have to look at the photographs of their factories over the last year, and you will see tracts, huge swathes of forest around these factories that are being cleared. And they're being cleared for new facilities. And those facilities will not spin out military equipment that will be relevant to the fight in Ukraine. That is, investment into expanded production that will be relevant in a couple of years' time for a very different purpose. The other side of that is that as they push more and more of their economy and pull more and more of their workers into that space, they also become increasingly dependent upon maintaining this level of military spending for the stability of their economy. And so I don't think we're going to see military spending go down. Right. I think this is a long-term trajectory and a long-term problem, and we need to think about it that way. So, having set out the challenge facing you, General, <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. what are we doing to meet it? Thanks, Dr. Wildling. I appreciate it. Uh, good to see everybody here this morning, a lot of my teammates here. I'll be honest up front, I thought we were here to talk about Army football, so I think I'm on the wrong panel right now, so <laughs> let's F and go, right, bro? Hey, um, <clears throat> About 41 years ago, uh, Second Lieutenant Williams showed up at uh, the easternly most fully deployed nuclear-capable eight-inch unit in the Army in Schweinfurt, Germany. Then it was Fulda, and now it's Savaki. And uh, with my teammates, we were just down in Foshkan a few weeks ago looking down in Romania. This is a relevant, dynamic theater. And as, the, as Dara just said and Jack just pointed out, it matters more than ever. United States Army, Europe, and Africa has transformed. I see one of the uh, former commanders in the group. Good to see you, sir. Uh, United States Army, Europe, and Africa uh, is at the nexus of three combatant commands and two continents. And they're interlinked. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that. You can ask me questions 
about how they're interlinked. NATO looks at it a certain way. NATO strategic direction south. They look at Africa. I look at it through my army hat a certain way, okay? But we are now more relevant than uh, we've ever been. Um, I work for Mike Langley uh, with my Africa hat. He's the combatant commander in AFRICOM. I work for General Chris Cavoli as the UCOM commander with my downtrace US hat. But I'm also the Allied LANCOM NATO commander uh, who will be the sea flick if we fight this. So I will fight all land forces. And here's the good news. All the folks you see in the first couple rows here, many of them, we're ready to go, uh, as was posed before. We're getting better. Are we perfect? No. But we are training together. It's never been, I've been in the Islands Alliance for 41 years, 17 years in Europe, and I've never seen it like that. It's really, really good. And I can talk if you've got questions about that later. So two continents, three combatant commands. Uh, Andy Ganey, who's in the front row here, wakes up every day thinking about Africa. Charlie Costanza, who's down here on the front row, the fifth corps commander. We're still working to complement and fill out his organization. Right. But Fifth Corps is Ford. It's the only deployed Ford Corps we have in our U.S. Army, Fifth Corps. And I'm working with the Army. So good to see many of the Army staff in here. But it's important that we continue to give these corps the NATO corps. I see Rafe Woodus here. And I don't know if there may be others. I haven't made contact with everybody in here. But the NATO corps are flat getting after it. So from the very eastern part of the alliance, the Ford Land Forces is the language we use. We have task forces there that are ready to scale up to brigades. The Germans are, are right now in the process of sending a brigade forward. The Canadians will have a brigade forward. All up and down the C2 spine of the alliance, task force are ready to turn into brigades to defeat Russian forces, which is another new thing that we've come about. So General Cavoli, um, after the Washington summit, was very clear. We need plans. To, to cohere, right? And we have three solid regional plans, which is our playbook, if you will, to use in the football analogy of how we'll, fight, how we'll fight this thing. Everybody knows their plan. And here's the great news. Since back when I was that second lieutenant 41 years ago, responsible for nukes, and if you'd see my grades at West Point, you'd go, really? We had him doing this? Um, everybody has dirt now, right? The German Netherlands Corps over the Baltics, MNC Northeast, all the way down. With, with my good friend Posse Valamaki and Johnny Linforce, Posse spoke last year and Johnny here this year, uh, we have depth and width and magazine depth like we've never had in NATO. Can we be better? Yeah, we will be. We're learning. We're getting better. We're growing together. And if you have questions about that, I won't take you through the whole depth and width of the alliance, but 32 strong and, and practicing with us every day. With the, with, with the U.S. cannot do it alone, right? Our treks, our training and exercise plan is like it's never been before, never been before. The highlight of that is our Defender Series. We do that every spring. Many of you all know about it. We go over really, next year, we will have all of the Nordic, our Nordic brothers will do joint forcible entry exercises simultaneously in Northern Europe. And then we'll go on to some more traditional, we'll expand the laundromat and do the things we've always done. You're, you're familiar with them, swift response, immediate response, saber guardian. That triumvirate of exercises allows us to sow strength to our allies and allows us to partner with them like we've done for years. Back in the day, it was reforger when we would come and assemble. So we're still doing those things. As was mentioned before, uh, RISS, Russian Intelligence Services, they are a threat to European allies, and as was mentioned, the possibility of miscalculations like it's never been before. Ask my Romanian brothers and sisters, I don't know if they're in the room, or ask my Polish brothers and sisters, right? All the way up and down the alliance, he's probing and looking. And folks are concerned. If you're in the Baltics, if you're in depth in Poland, if you're down in Romania, um, I just pushed some forces down. I don't know if Kurt's in the room here, but Kurt King just pushed some forces down to reassure our Romanian friends. My number one uh, line of effort as the USER commander is to set the theater. Uh, Ron Reagan out of the 21st, lights out good. Lights out good. Works with all of our allies. Works with uh, JSEC. Um, was Alex Olfrank's soon-to-be Kai Roy Schneider. 
Uh, we are working and setting th- we're working on port resiliency. How do we come in different places? Our Polish friends have been very, very uh, helpful. We now have a power projection platform in uh, Poditz, which is equal to none in the world. And Ron Reagan watches that for us. We watch over the um, all of the all of the alliance here has committed a lot to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Um, U.S. primarily oversees that, but it's going to transition here pretty soon. You may have heard of in situ. So the security assistance group Ukraine run by General Curtis Buzzard will transition to in situ and NATO will oversee that effort. Right now, as we speak at Grafenvir, Steve Carpenter, very capable 7 ATC hands, is training the 153rd Ukrainian Brigade right now as we speak. General Kovoli and I, as we've gone back and forth with General Sierski, we talk to him every week. We brief the SECDEF every week. What do you need, General? Uh, we need the ability to train more forces. All the alliance, our British friends, all of us are all training, equipping from the basic level to company level to collective level to core level. And Steve Carpenter can do all of that at Grafenvir, from the squad level all the way up to the core level and campaign coalition. John Rafferty, 56 fires. You'll hear a little bit tomorrow. He's got a, on a panel tomorrow with uh, Charlie and Ron. Uh, transformative of what we're doing with fires. The Ukrainians are laying wood to the Russians with their fires campaign. They're laying absolute wood. They have pushed them back off the Black Sea and they're having devastating effects. Three of the seven strategic ASPs, ASPs have been defeated thanks to Ukrainian fires. And more to follow. So just stay tuned. A lot of that help is John Rafferty and the second MDTF. If you've got questions about the MDTF, I can talk about that. Transformative. We need long range precision fires on the theater. We need hypersonic weapons on the theater. We need to continue to show strength to NATO and working with our alliance. And that's what we're doing. Last thing, my boss, General Cavoli, a bunch of them, but uh, General Cavoli <clears throat> in his guidance to all the US generals and forces in his theory of success, has talked about, very first, NATO alliance first, war fighting focus. We're about war fighting the United States Army, Europe, and Africa, and plans based. Very clear message to the U.S. forces there. NATO alliance first. Now, that's not transformative for for General Cavoli. He's been in Europe as long as I have. But we're communicating a very clear voice to all of our alliance. We're here with you. We're not going anywhere. We have a plan. You have dirt. We're ready to go. We're training war fighting focus. So I think I'll stop there and look forward to your questions and I'll turn it over to back to uh, Jack. Uh, so General Williams highlighted the importance of planning. Um, I mean, the Russians are really good at plans. They have lots of them. They're very detailed. Uh, what happens when those plans are distributed to their units is a slightly different story. Um, but I think what that speaks to is that actually, you know, uh, Dara, Johnny, and I had um, breakfast in, in Sweden last week. Uh, we were meeting in, I think, February in Germany uh, as well, and then previously uh, in June. Um, and so just this year, this, this gang has got together a few times. And if we were to look across this room and all of the social connections that exist in this forum, Uh, It would be a pretty dense interlocking mesh of relationships and pretty positive ones. Going anywhere with General Williams takes three times as long as it should because (laughs) everyone's always walking up and saying, hey, man. Um, But the point is that goodwill and that mutual understanding is in many ways what Russian units lack. And it makes a real difference because it means when you have those plans, people are prepared to take risk for one another and make things work. Um, and so forums like this exactly. and the exercises, everything that goes behind it, is absolutely critical to making those plans executable. Um, and so as the, the, one of the latest members of uh, this friendship group, um, Sweden obviously has to work out all of the slightly intricate and arcane uh, structures that you are plugging into. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective on how we're doing. Thank you, Jack. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, first of all, I'm uh, honored to, to 
be able to sit in this panel with you guys. That's, uh, that's cool. Uh, and uh, I want to give you a, a Swedish perspective from, uh, from uh, being the latest uh, NATO member uh, and uh, trying to align and trying to, to integrate as soon as possible during an, an era of NATO transforming parallel. So we're, we're trying, trying to run uh, in the same pace. And uh, being the non-native speaker, I will use a couple of slides and, and maps just to make sure my, my message uh, comes through. So first of all, if you look at this map, it's uh, Swedocentric. Sweden is the center of the globe. That's my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but there's also another message in this one, because uh, the, the world looks different to you in this, in this picture. Uh, but it also looks different to me because that's uh, the new picture of, of uh, the AOR of uh, the Swedish army. From being Sweden to being NATO, 360, and uh, thinking in another, another way. Uh, but also, if you look at, uh, at uh, the ice cap up uh, north, and you look at Russia in red, you realize that Alaska is uh, Russia's eastern flank. And the Scandinavian uh, Peninsula and, uh, and uh, the Baltics uh, is Russia's Easter flank. We're connected. Uh, and uh, actually, PACOM and, and UCOM is also connected by Russia. So it's, a, it's a always uh, interdependencies. And uh, what happens in, in PACOM will create re reactions in UCOM and, and vice versa. So if you zoom in a little bit. Uh, on Europe, 32 nations, same objective. But uh, Sweden and Finland becoming uh, NATO members actually sh changed uh, the dynamics a little bit. So we're bringing in the geography uh, and the forces. So we're changing the equation. Uh, for example, sustaining the Baltic states uh, through, the, through the Baltic Sea suddenly get out of dynamics. It's not just only the Sovalki gap anymore. There's a, a, a number of other options. Uh, there is a, an, a, a change for Russia in their battle space management. They suddenly got the whole Finnish border to, to manage. Uh, and a change in force ratio, which they have to take in consideration. But uh, the theme is convergence. And, and as I said, we have to converge as well. Uh, it's uh, about transformation in contact, uh, and uh, as uh, Jack alluded to, versus transformation out of contact. The speed, the pace of change, and, uh, and the control is completely different, meaning that we have to accept risks, but we also have to be sure that we, we are able to align between the third two nations. And uh, to my point, it's, uh, it's done in three pillars, the conceptual factors, factors, the physical factors, and the moral factors. And if you dive into the, the conceptuals, it's about uh, policy, a huge policy shift for Sweden from being uh, non-allies to becoming an ally. Uh, a shift in strategy and a shift in tactics. So from being very focused on, on the Swedish territory, where it says rear in this picture, uh, to actually uh, being focused on, on the alliance's eastern border. So this is the, the Swedish army perspective on battle space management uh, as an ally. So from being a, a close fight area, where we prepared ourselves and planned for, for making the close fight, we now perceive ourselves as being uh, the rear area, and we're going to fight in the close area. Uh, Sweden's posture is changing. We will contribute to the, the forward land forces in Latvia. Uh, we will uh, uh, come up with a, a great idea how to create a, a Nordic uh, forward land forces uh, in the northern regions. 
there is uh, a doctrinal shift in, in uh, battle space management, as I said, uh, but also uh, a relearning about fighting in echelons about brigade because we have been really brigade centric. So we're getting a lot of help from, from Five Core and Charlie Constances and, and the UCOM user of team to, to align into how to contribute into the deep fight. But uh, you can also change the perspective. So if you look from Russia, uh, Sweden's position from a Rus Russian perspective is the deep. So everything we want to do to Russia in the deep, they want to do to us in, uh, in our territories. So we also have to, to come up with a new tactical concept that make us uh, uh, a net contributor to, to the close fight, but also an uh, idea how to manage the deep and, uh, and the Swedish territory. We will, of course, be a portion of, uh, of demonstrating, uh, contribute to deterrence, uh, but enabling and sustaining uh, will also be a major role for Sweden. But also, of course, defend and being able to, or ready to restore East is, uh, is uh, the main priority. If you look at the fiscal factors, uh, the geography, as I said, changes the equation. The Svalky gap, I want to come back to that because being able to, to use the sea lines of communication, utilize the fact that the Danish Straits, the, the Danish island of Bornholm, the Swedish island of Gotland, uh, the, the islands of Öslund uh, in, uh, in Estonia, the Gulf of Finland, are all native territory. And uh, they give a really good opportunity to control the Baltic Sea. It's still contested. It's not a NATO lake because there's competition going on every day, uh, especially on the seabed warfare side, but also on surface. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, windmills uh, offshore, which is not on internal waters that need to be protected anyway, but it's also a, an issue. Uh, but also looking at the map, uh, I would hate being the, the commanding general of uh, the 11th Russian Army Corps in Kaliningrad because that person will start the fight being surrounded from the beginning. Uh, and that's not a really good position you want to be in. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the Swedish Army organization, I have been uh, tasked to double the army. Uh, it's, uh, we have a little dip in, uh, in equipment because we're also making huge donations to, to Ukraine. The best way ever to, to be able to spend uh, uh, the resources we have. The equipment is made to, to kill Russians and that's what it's doing right now. So I'm really proud of what we're doing and we'll keep uh, supporting Ukraine. But I also have the task to double the army. We are increasing the defense spendings. Uh, we will reach uh, uh, a number between 2.5% and 3% uh, next year. Uh, but I'm also tasked to, to create reserves of personnel, uh, increase the depth of uh, stockpiles, uh, create a support, a robust support and sustained uh, network for NATO in Sweden, and replace the, the equipment uh, we donate to, to Ukraine. And, hence also modernizing the army. So a very uh, interesting task, exciting task. I love to have it, but it's also hard. It's hard because uh, we are also needing to transform the, the units from being optimized for auto area operations, battalion focused task groups, uh, we have a tradition of coming of fighting in, in echelons, but we optimized ourselves for auto area operations in battalion size units. Now we have to unfold this and, uh, and uh, do the backwards engineering of uh, tailored units to fight in echelons above battalion and, and brigade. But uh, also, uh, 
we need to design the, the organization, the units, to win the duel in the close fight uh, when you compare it to a Russian unit. So we, we will eventually end up fighting the close fight. Uh, it will be in the, the subarctic environment, which is not similar to, to Central Europe or, or the CONUS. So there's a very sparse road network. Uh, mobility is important, but it's hard to hide. Very few roads, as I said, it's hard to sustain. But you still need heavy units to, to be able to win the duel in the close. Uh, we need to align the connectivity to be able to fight in echelons, and that's an issue. Uh, we need to uh, have the same cryptos, we need to have the same protocols and standards for, for example, uh, wayband networking waveforms, which we're not having right now. Uh, and we need to be able to federate information and make the multi-domain fight a reality at scale. When we look at moral factors, factors <coughs> will, leadership, and values, as I said, uh, the doctrine and the, the policy shift in Sweden is, uh, is of importance. We have a really robust concept of total defense that's also evolving, meaning that everyone, every citizen in Sweden from 16 years old up to 70 years old are under uh, they are. Uh, they have to serve by law uh, to contribute to to the total defense, which builds resili resilience in the in the whole society. Uh, there's a co-ownership of the the defense forces within the population uh, because we're still doing conscription. Uh, that also gives me. The, the possibility to actually create reserves. We can handle manpower and, uh, and uh, recruiting. Uh, we have a really, really powerful mes message from our government uh, explaining what's at stake, democracy, liberties, the rights and ob obligations you have as, as uh, a population, uh, explaining how to act in, in crisis and conflicts, and what preparations you as a citizen are supposed to, to do in order to support the, the nation. So the message from the government curr currently is not, uh, it, it is, uh, ask what you can you do for your nation, do not ask what your nation can do for you. Uh, but the co-ownership and, and the total defense is a, a really uh, important part of the moral, fac moral factors. Uh, but also, uh, I learned a, a really new, uh, my new favorite, favorite, favorite expression yesterday uh, from Secretary Wormuth. Uh, being able to, to utilize creative acquisition. Because the bureaucracy in, in peace and conflict is one thing. It's uh, pretty much built to defend against uh, corruption and... Uh, and uh, uh, keeping a, a very controlled pace of, uh, of uh, how procurement is done. But now we are transforming in contact and we need to accept risk in that venue as well. Being able to, to do procurement quickly in order to, to utilize mission command even in that venue. So, a few perspectives that uh, that I sit on and uh, and how I view the world and uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. So a Swedish uh, tank crew using Swedish solutions to a Swedish problem. Hey, thanks. Jack, before you go, hey, go back to the picture that I do with the with the flag, the soldier. Hey, you'll need 10 of those guys with this sword dipped in some fire. We can take on Putin right now, man. <laughs> That's a badass looking dude right there. Yeah. Let's give the, let me give everybody a pan, clan of hand. There you go. I, 
Jack, over to you. Before we go to Q&A, I just want to highlight that I think General Linforce has just given us a masterclass in the difference between Americans and Europeans. <laughs> Uh, because there used to be this joke about the New York Times, which was that you never knew which page you'd find the front page story on, <laughs> right? Uh, the casualness with which you, <laughs> with which you uh, enlightened us about the fact that you've been tasked to double the size of your army. It's just slipped in there slightly. <laughs> it's worth emphasizing because there is sometimes a, a view, I think, that Europeans are not responding to the threat. Yeah. Uh, and the, the scale of the institutional task, noting that for a long time, Europe wasn't uh, well positioned, but the institutional task, the magnitude of the task of doubling the size of your force shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, you mentioned your support for Ukraine and the impact on your equipment. You might have seen stories in the news about a pretty significant number of Swedish infantry fighting vehicles cool. making their way through Czechia a couple of weeks, uh, last week. Uh, no major announcement around it. Um, but a lot of European countries keep fairly quiet about what they do. Absolutely. Sweden is one of those countries that does a lot. Um, and so, you know, I just think that's, that's worth drawing out. Um, so we're going to have some microphones down the center here. If people want to, to come up, um, then I will draw on you. While people are just cogitating and working out what they want to ask, I'm going to fire off some, some brief, <coughs> albeit potentially, hopefully tricky questions to the panel. Uh, and I'm going to start with Dara, because I think if I ask General Williams, he'll say I can't comment. <laughs> um, which is that, you know, we, we highlighted um, in 2018, the U.S. published its national defense strategy, and that suggested that we needed to broaden the competition with our adversaries because the, the scale that we could compete at would overmatch them. And yet what we've seen in the last couple of years is we, we have become very fixated on the main effort in Ukraine, which is great, but actually Russia has made considerable gains. We, they have kicked us out of three countries in Africa now and are aiming to do more. Um, and so was the premise of that national defense strategy wrong, do you think, that actually we're not very good at dealing with wide competition? And do we need to broaden the aperture? Do we need to look at this threat as 360 to Europe um, and potentially, you know, from the US's point of view, wider than just this one narrow piece of front? Well, I think adjusting the NDS is overdue. <clears throat> and frankly, we probably need a revision to our Russia strategy as well. And I think there's two ways to, to look at this phenomenon here. And the optimistic read is that Russia knows that they cannot confront NATO head on conventionally right now uh, while they're engaged in Ukraine. And even if their program to reconstitute is wildly successful, um, we're looking at several year vulnerability for the Russian Federation. So what are they doing? They're going into, uh, <laughs> they're trying to outmaneuver us in Africa and among our allies in the Middle East and, and, and turn on different pain points in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific as well. But then I think, what do they have to offer? If we just take Africa as an example, and we, we spoke a little bit about this in the green room, it's a, they're extracting. They're extracting blood diamonds, blood gold. It's used to finance Wagner when Wagner was functional under Prigozhin, and it still in some ways is doing that. They're taking um, human beings, and they're putting them directly into to units in the Russian Federation with little to no training. The casualty rates are extreme. They're recruiting Russian women to build Shahed drones without safety equipment with chemicals so caustic it is causing their faces to blister while Russian women, you know, they don't let them work with those chemicals by law because it's harmful for their fertility. So Russia doesn't really have a hopeful vision to offer these places. What they have is violence and they have is money. That's it. So we, you know, we do have to be creative in how we address these things using our advantages. So, you know, I, to, to sort of answer your question, I just think it's overdue. And in some ways, now we are focused because the threat is that much sharper than it was five, six years ago. So I remain optimistic, but I think it is time to, to dust off a few defense strategies. General Williams, do you want to write a reply or are you happy with that one? I'm happy with that one. Very good. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, in which case, um, so in your presentation, I think you spoke about the, the C flick yeah. uh, and we've had the conversation about the, the M flick. Just very briefly, what's wrong with Army Group? 
because we keep expanding the number of acronyms, but actually, I, I'm joking. The, the, ser the serious point I want to get after is that um, you mentioned all of these plans. You've got the regional plans in NATO, you've got the UCOM plan, uh, you've got individual national defense plans, uh, you have five cores potentially operating in a bit of battle space, but when you start looking at the G-locks, it's like three roads in a forest track. Um, and so how are you, if we're converging, um, managing the fact that we have more and more planning, and yet there's only so much battle space, and this is becoming extremely congested. Um, how are we kind of reducing the number of plans, if that makes sure. sense at some point? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, my third football analogy here, uh, we're practicing, right? We're practicing like we used to do back in the day, right, in the GDP, if I could bring you back for those in the room that know that. Um, we just finished uh, arguably the biggest exercise we've done since uh, the 80s called Avenger Triad, where my deputy commander general, multi-core capable, land component command, Miklik, and there are three of them. Uh, currently, uh, Posse is, has the care and feeding of the one in the north, the land component command. Sean Bernabe, my deputy, is the one in Central Europe, and then in the south, uh, my deputy down. I have another headquarters. I didn't talk about it earlier. But my NATO hat, I have about 500 folks down there in Izmir, Turkey. And uh, right now, Nick Zanelli is that land component command. So we're doing it through practicing. Rafe Woodus. Adam Yokes, Joachim von Sandrat, uh, Nico Tack, all practice over about two weeks, and we learned a lot. And your question, I remember a conversation in our AAR between Charlie and Rafe and others about the congestion. I and mean, we had cores passing each other. Think about that. We haven't done that in a while since I was a captain in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We've actually physically done it, right? We did it in game. We're going to have to practice it. No other theater is passing cores in a fight. No other theater. In Europe, we're doing that. Europe, large-scale combat operations. So we're practicing. We're getting better. We learned a lot. Over this next year, the Miklik will practice seven more times in a variety of different exercises. And then the other thing I would say, the second point would be, uh, Johnny sort of hinted at it, we now have access to the maritime piece, and it actually came up in the exercise. We talked about not just stuck through Savalki and G locks, but our maritime locks as well. So Finland and Sweden coming in allows us to thicken and create uh, resiliency and robustness in how we'll resupply the Baltics or Central Europe, like we've never had before. We did not have that until Finland and Sweden came in. Now we have uh, someone setting the edge up in the north there and, and looking after what uh, Johnny talked about in his very good presentation. So I think it's reps, I think it's multiple, I think it's re resiliency and robustness in lines of communication, using multi-domain operations to do that, I think is how we will do that. And we just gotta practice it. We're on the very nascent edge of this, very nascent edge. People, there was a lot of angst, you know, how are we gonna do this, can Williams do it? I said, I don't know if I can do it. I think we're the right guy to do it, right team to do it, United States Army, Europe, and Africa. I think uh, General Pasi Valamaki is the right one to do it in the North, and I think my other headquarters in Izmir. I think so. So we're gonna find out, we're gonna learn, we're gonna iterate, we're gonna do what armies do. We're gonna learn, we're gonna adapt, we're gonna do AARs, and we're gonna get better, we're gonna win. So that's how I would respond to that. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you can spot that, yeah. And we're gonna beat Navy too. Shit, I'll get that in there. So uh, I, I was having drinks with a friend uh, last night, and we rewatched that famous SNL sketch uh, where George Washington is laying out some of the founding aspects of his vision for America and saying, <laughs> we will have a nation which measures things in yards and miles, except for track and field. And then, then it will be meters. And one of his subordinates says, why are we doing that, General? He says, no one knows. <laughs> yeah. Now, the reason I bring that up is that, you know, NATO and its standards and its procedures yeah. have grown over time, and when each of these decisions were made, it may have made sense, but you walk in, a fresh, you know, have a fresh look, and you go, why is that like that? Yeah. Um, so as Sweden has walked into NATO, where do you think we should relook at things to kind of sharpen our edge, General? What's your, do you have a view on where we can, we can uh, improve our game? Yeah, <clears throat> hey, thanks. 
So I, I get a flashback uh, from, from yesterday, Lars. <laughs> or, so, sorry. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, Norway being, uh, being the most uh, EU-adapted non-EU member and Sweden being the most uh, NATO-adapted uh, non-NATO member. And we come, came to the conclusion that uh, the, the size and form of bananas is, uh, is a game changer. But uh, <laughs> actually, looking into to NATO standards, we, we've been trying to adapt for, for a long time. But uh, th something I, I mentioned already, and I'm looking enviously at my, my service chief colleagues in, in the Air Force and Navy, is the connectivity. Uh, because they they use Link 16 and Link 22 in, in the Air Force and Navy, uh, and the land side, we, we look at each other with confusion and say, hey, how, how do we connect? How do we get the flow information running? Uh, we do it. Uh, we do it a lot by swivel shares and, and uh, the good relations you may mentioned, but we really, really need to, to come together and, and get the connectivity uh, working. So that's, that's one really important issue. Uh, then there's also the standardization and the qualification of, of munitions. So we're standardized. We all use uh, 155 millimeters uh, uh, artillery ammunition. But I cannot take a Norwegian grenade and put it into a uh, Swedish tube before qualify, qualifying it and, and sorting out the ballistics. So the, the nitty gritty details matters. And we can do them, do better. So if it's if it's good for a, a Norwegian gun, it's good for a Swedish gun. I think the Ukrainians have been working through a lot of the nitty gritty detail on that challenge for, sure. for a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in which case, this is now your turn uh, to hold us to account. So, microphones in the middle. Uh, can I please go to our first question? Morning. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to the panel for coming here. Uh, great insights that you've given. Um, Colonel Dexter Nunley, I'm the uh, chief of staff for the C command and control cross-functional team. I'm not going to talk network stuff. I've got a question uh, on the NDS, and I'd like to pull the thread on, on what Ms. Dar uh, responded with earlier. So we know, I think it was about five, six months ago, China and, and Russia publicly came out and and re-announce their, their partnership. Um, from a NATO perspective, given how China is trying to influence globally as well, um, focused on, on Taiwan right now, and the U.S. is focused in that area, um, when we talk about messaging to Russia, um, if something happened in the Pacific, the U.S.'s focus would immediately shift there, uh, which now leads Russia to focus on those eastern partners in the, on the NATO front and, and possibly engage. So from a NATO perspective, what messaging are we not just sending to Russia, but trying to send to China as well to deter um, any activity uh, from either one of those partners? Thank you very much. Um, I think, General Williams, you should address yeah. that. But if you want some time to think, then Dara, no. do you want to start? Um, go ahead, go ahead, Dara. <laughs> From the Russian perspective, what, what they're looking at, you know, just from the red lens, they're looking at the Baltics um, building physical barriers along the border. That matters. That slows things down. The civil defense that Sweden does also matters because they think this is not a society that I want to pick a fight with because people know or, or will increasingly know what their jobs are as citizens if there's a fight. Um, I would also highlight um, you know, the unity in Polish society. Um, there's not a lot of cracks there for, for Russia to exploit. They're, um, they're very anti-Russian. So all of those, those things matter. Um, in terms of, of messaging uh, for, for China and everything else, and, and if there is a pivot, if there is a scenario where we have to pivot, um, for, for our European partners, if Russia's testing you, if Russia's probing you, 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 you have to check them in the first step or they will progress to the next. And I, I will highlight um, what Turkey did when a Russian aircraft violated its airspace a few too many times in Syria. They shot down an aircraft. Shot it down. Was there a war between Russia and Turkey about it? No, there was not. There was not a Russian NATO war. And guess what? Russian pilots were not careless anymore about coming too close to the border. So if we do find ourselves in that scenario, I hope we never, um, we never do. 
Um, that strength in the early phases, and again, we're already in the early phases because it's happening at the sabotage, checking it at this level is the only way to get them to stop. We did it once with Wagner in Syria several years ago. Wagner never came at us again. So that's, that's what I would recommend as a civilian who's never held command. But as an advisor to those who do, um, that is what I would recommend. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. Uh, I don't see it as either or mutually exclusive. If he were to do that, he's going to get uh, a fist sandwich in his mouth. Is what he, Our alliance is very capable. Along, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't go in great detail. But the C2 spine, the Ford Land Forces, their task force there, but they have the ability in my headquarters, my LANCOM headquarters, we test the readiness of them every day. In fact, we just briefed SAC here last Friday on, on their strength and viability. So these core commanders, two of them are in the room here, they can fight. Uh, I'd like for him to try. Uh, I think he can continue to try to play that as he, as he may, but uh, he will find a very viable force that's ready to defend and defeat uh, him there. So I, I don't see it as if he goes there, he's gonna pray. He'll find someone that's ready to go. Uh, these, these forces down here can fight and they can win. Thank you. <clears throat> In which case, um, General Linfors, is there anything you want to add? Otherwise? No, I think I, I already made a point that it's interconnected. It's interconnected. So the, yeah. Cool, cool. In which case, next question. Thank you. Um, I, I hear a lot about the planning, which is great. The exercising together, there's the old adage, no plan survives first contact. And General Lindenford, you mentioned uh, connectivity and federating information. Uh, the United States working on JADS, Joint All Domain Command and Control, Project Convergence with the Army, overmatch with the Navy. Can, can, can you speak a little bit to how we're working on that all domain uh, command and control across the coalition forces? Yeah. Uh, can you just introduce yourself quickly? Uh, Troy Chevalier, U.S. Falcon. I'm Thank a you. retired officer and engineer, which is why command and control is cultural. It's, it's a thing, but it's also got to have an infrastructure underneath it. Thank you very much. Hey, so what we're doing is uh, we are, we're participating in the, in the project convergence. Uh, we're invited. We're participating in, in the Bold Quest exercise series that, that uh, the J Levels uh, is performing. Uh, there is a, a federated, federated mission network uh, initiative within the NATO family as well going on. Uh, but the technology is actually the easy portion. The, the tricky portion is how to tag and share intelligence, how to tag and share information, uh, and how to, to utilize it. So we had an example of, of excellent support from, from Charlie Costanza and his team Five Corps arranging a, a war fighting symposium in, uh, in Norway, uh, bringing uh, the Nordics together, uh, running through procedures and techniques how to actually uh, align ourselves and, and to handle the information. So I think there's a lot, a lot is being done, but uh, there's still, uh, still uh, yeah, some, dot, some dots need to be connected but we're, we're in a really good pathway. Thank you. General Williams, I don't know if you want to add anything yeah. on that challenge, because yeah. I, I've certainly Please. seen you go mm. into a US headquarters versus a multinational headquarters, and it does often feel like we've got a, a two-speed NATO, shall we say, in this space. Yeah, um, we're wrapping our arms around the whole thing. Um, so you've got all kinds of interoperability, right? Human, procedural, technical. And as uh, Jack mentioned earlier, we're, we're really good at that. You can see I have all these guys in the front row are my friends. I'm using, you know, first name. They use my first name. Um, the technical aspect of it has a ways to go. Uh, NATO is committed to it. The U.S., I'm sure you're familiar with the things that the U.S. Army is doing, C2 FIG, C2 NEXT. And so my signal ears, all my smart network engineer guys like you are working to do that. But... Uh, I don't, I'm not overwhelmed by it. I think we can get there. Um, it requires us to iterate and learn in these exercises that I talked about, and we just get better. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it's not, gonna def it's not something that we can't overcome. Um, what I will tell you is these headquarters, what we're learning from Ukraine, 
What we're learning from exercising is that these headquarters have to be smaller. If you emit, you will be hit. If you can be seen, you will be hit. So not only the infrastructure you talked about, but how we communicate. My own headquarters, uh, I've challenged my team. Uh, if you've been to Wiesbaden, I'm not fighting out of that thing. I'm going to fight forward. I'm going to move a lot. Um, in this last exercise we did in Avenger Triad, all the cores moved. Um, if you want to talk more, General Woodis is up in the front row here. Um, I don't remember exactly. He can give you the details. But his entire core footprint, he measured how much he emitted over the course of 10 days. It was very, very low signature. Uh, and I went right by it. I didn't even see it. He actually built on what was done the year before in Romania when we exercised. He, his core headquarters was in a junkyard. And I went by it. I think Sanford and Son was over there. But I don't know. But uh, I went over some of your heads, I know. But uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, we are doing a lot with interoperability, with C2, with how we connect with each other. But those are things we just got to get after. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get defeated by things like that. We just got to get after it. Thank you. It's worth noting that it is a space that the Russians have made really significant progress yeah. in. Uh, and their kill chains now, you know, they went into the war in Ukraine with a, with a concept. They now have a capability when it comes to integrating C2 for their flyers. Um, and so it's a, it's a problem where we have to remain competitive. It's exactly. not just about getting advantage. Um, do we I have tell another? you if I could, let me just one more. Uh, so when CD was over there, when General Donahue was running the Security Assistance Group Ukraine, you know, we'd look at the various things, working with our partners, and we could see very easily, uh, and, and Jack knows this better than all of us, he's been there multiple times, you could see, oh, there's a, there's a C2 headquarters, there they are. And then they started to change. Over the last two and a half years, through Tony Agudo and now Curtis Buzzard, they're hard to find. Uh, they, have made, they, have, they have learned. They're bigger, they're learning, uh, and, the, and the kill chain that Jack talked about is the thing that we're going to have to continue with and stay competitive with. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, I promise I'll make it short. Trish Martinelli, retired U.S. Army CEO of The Difference. I don't think that in this room, uh, within the Beltway or within the Army of any nation, we would have to make sense of why the conflict, especially in Ukraine and then more broadly, uh, the safety of NATO makes sense. But November is coming, hmm. and there will be either incremental or radical changes to the support that we see currently uh, to the fight in Ukraine. If you had an opportunity, and I'd like to each of the panel members to speak to this, if you had the opportunity to paint a picture of why this conflict makes sense to the American public writ large, what would you say to the average American outside of the Beltway? Dar? Okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and the, you can often find the cost of freedom buried in the ground. Ukraine is fighting for freedom. They're not fighting to be part of the Russian system. They're fighting to be part of our traditions and democracy mm -hmm. and the freedom to choose uh, a life that you want and not have to live like the people in the Russian Federation do. So freedom is not free. And they're not asking us to fight. They're asking us to help them fight. So uh, to me, it's, it's putting your money where your mouth is. Do we believe in our system or do we not? General Williams? I can, I can pick up. Okay. Uh, so I would say it's about the, the values and the security order. If we want to have the freedoms, the liberty, and democracy that we, we currently have, that's what's at stake. That's what's being challenged right now. So Russia's offer to, to the world is uh, areas of influence, uh, small states not having uh, control of their choices and territories. and. Uh, completely different way of managing the world. Noting that we are just ahead of November, you may <laughs> not want to uh, comment, yeah. which I think could be quite reasonable. But I, I might offer a, a very brief response, which is, you know, when I used to, to travel around, uh, whether it was in the Middle East or in Europe or in Africa um, or in the Indo-Pacific, and you spoke to governments, everyone wanted to know what the US position was and what the US thought. And the reason why so many countries deferred to the United States on security issues is because when the U.S., even though if you, put, if you put all of the U.S.'s security commitments and you turned them on at the same time, the U.S. would not be able to meet them, right? But everyone essentially believed that 
if they found themselves in difficulties, the United States would honor its commitments to them. And that was a, an article of faith among a lot of nations because of how they perceived US power. And that meant that the US often doesn't have to do things because people defer to US interests. And it means that the United States has a lot of friends around the world. Now, I was in Taiwan uh, in the autumn last year. And the Taiwanese government were fascinated in lessons from Ukraine. And they were tracking the conflict very, very closely. Because the story of Ukraine to them is a question of whether a small state can stand up for its independence and succeed against the odds. And that, that bears relation as to whether they think the fight is worth it, whether the risk can be taken. And so the real challenge for the United States is that it has committed itself publicly to back Ukraine for as long as it takes. And there's a lot of other rhetoric that's been used. So long as countries believe that's true, you have a lot of friends around the world. If you start dropping those commitments, then a lot of people will start changing their calculuses and they'll start hedging. And when that happens, the threats come closer to home. So you can win the fight away or you can win it at home. It's a lot cheaper to do it away. Um, but that would be my five yeah, cents. Yeah, I can, I can dabble in this a little bit. So regardless of the election, uh, my commitment to my brothers and sisters here in the room won't change, right? United States Army, Europe, Africa is committed to uh, working with uh, and alongside shoulder to shoulder is what I would tell you. Um, this is existential. I think values are superordinate to this. They're immutable. Uh, our, what we stand for in our country, what these nations stand for, are higher than this fight. I, I, I agree. Um, my son, who's a Green Beret, who's uh, just finishing French, I think, next week, and I just test him. His French isn't very good, so you should be afraid. <laughs> but, uh, um, I tell him, I said, hey, brother, uh, West Africa? or perhaps uh, somewhere further east where I'm at, be ready, because the American soldier uh, fights where he's told to fight. He's always done that, he or she's always done that, and they will do it in the future. So as I mentioned, the immutable nature of this conflict, it is, I think Dara mentioned, or somebody mentioned it, this is bigger than just Russia and Ukraine. This is about our values, this is about our democratic way of life, and um, that's, that's kind of what it'll be, regardless of how the election turns out. Yeah. Next question. Yes, good, good morning. Carson Chekets from OSD INS. Uh, first, thank you, gentlemen, both for your service, and thank you, colleagues, for being here. Uh, my question was based on something I heard on BBC recently, which was that Russia's economy is roughly the size of Italy's. And I also heard that they're really hemorrhaging talent from Russia, both on the corporate sector side and also in terms of intellectual capital. So I just wanted to, to pose the question, what other weaknesses are we seeing develop in Russia? Thank you. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, how, much, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, no, the, you know, when I, when I think about um, all the strengths that we have and all the weaknesses that they have, um, it's material, it's relationships, as General Williams was saying, that, that we have and they, they simply don't. Um, but to answer your question on intellectual brain drain, I think the estimates when Russia announced mobilization a few years ago, 600,000 or so military-aged males left Russia. Some have returned, some never will. Um, they're talented labor, and they didn't want to you know, participate in a, a meat grinder war. Um, but more importantly than that, um, you know, the Russian system has, has real intellectual firepower within it but they do not have a tradition of speaking truth to power. That is one of our best advantages that we have in our societies. I can offer my advice knowing that it's not popular or wanted and know that I'm not going to be fired or imprisoned for doing so. They don't have that luxury. Their intelligence services don't have that luxury. They led one of the world's greatest armies to ruin in Ukraine because they can't speak truth to power about the assumptions that they were making. So I, you know, I think that we have a lot of inherent talent mm. built into our society. Uh, we have a lot of innovation that we can, we can use. I just met some folks walking in this morning that invest in small businesses. I don't know if y'all are in here. You said you were going to be. But um, you know, that is a talent that we have that the Russian system doesn't have. They can't access startups very well, although they're trying. 
Um, so you know, when I when I look at them and I look at us, there's you know there's a difference in GDP, of course, and, and if you look at it in those absolute terms, yes, they have a, a small economy, but they are willing to twist and contort and mortgage their future to see this thing through in the short mm. run. There are aspects about their military culture that they they have ruined, or maybe some um, might say it's just a return to the Soviet past again. Um, that's a generational problem that they're going to be picking apart. So I don't know. I, I, I guess despite all of this, I'm, st I'm still an optimist. We have so much latent potential, and I, you know, but we have to use it. We have to make bold choices, and we have to make it now because they are going to regenerate, and we have to program that cycle now. Do you have a view on Russian weaknesses that you'd want to share? Yeah, I can't. Maybe not a weakness, but uh, something you had to add to, to the equation also is when it comes to, to finances and economy, uh, the purchase power parity, uh, which is completely different for Russia. They are able to, to build equipment at a completely uh, different price level uh, because they, they draw from, uh, as Dara told, uh, there is uh, blood diamonds involved, there's uh, depleting of, uh, of uh, African nations, uh, there is uh, a completely different uh, way of, uh, of uh, using labor to achieve the, the goals they need to achieve. General Williams? Um, regardless how this turns out, we will have a Russian problem. Um, it's an enduring problem. I think it's um, I like, I wrote that down, I like that. They're willing to twist or mortgage their future to win now. So it's existential, they want to win. Um, weaknesses, and there I mentioned them all. Um, they're stronger than they were, they're bigger than they were when they entered the war. Um, they're on pace to recruit 360,000 people this year. Think about the things you're gonna hear today and yesterday about our great army, U.S. Army, 360,000 without doing a, uh, a formal sort of recruitment drive. 360,000 on pace. They are losing in one direction, and I won't go into too much detail, a thousand casualties a day right now. That is large-scale combat op operations. As you look around the world, I don't know if the, the, uh, the arithmetic is the same. It's different in Europe and potentially different in the future. So um, I, I don't see them, while they're bleeding, they can take a punch, many punches, and are willing to, to do things um, to, to go all in on this. And so we gotta be ready. And, and then I, I will just, one more time, the miscalculation piece is as high as it's ever been. I can't talk too much about it in this theater, but they're not your traditional actors that are doing a lot of this probing around my AOR right now. There are other folks. Um, they're not more classically trained folks. I think you all know where I'm going. And so the risk for miscalculation is high. We could tumble into this thing uh, because of the people that are currently snooping around Europe and causing mischief in all of our backyards. I think the really interesting thing is that the Russians, uh, they're not actually doing everything they could to win this by quite a long way. Um, the military advice to the Russian government was mobilized by April of 2022. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of advice in the military saying they need, need to do another round now. There are multiple other examples where the official advice to the Kremlin has been one thing, and the decision has not been taken. And that speaks to real concerns. It speaks to the fact that they have to balance risk, as Dara highlighted before. Um, and so there are constraints. There are absolutely constraints and vulnerabilities that the Kremlin feels. Um, but if we are in a situation where if you add all of the investment across Europe into uh, munitions production for 155 together, you're looking at production hitting maybe 720,000 rounds a year, between that and 1 million, uh, by 2028 at the moment. Um, Russia is currently producing 3.5 million rounds a year and getting another million roughly from other sources uh, and from refurbishment. Um, and that number is going up. Now, when you have that disparity in production, maybe GDP is not a very useful thing to measure the military industrial strength that you're comparing. 
Um, and I think that's, you know, we like, to, we like to use standard methodologies that we can very easily compare, but actually countries are pretty complicated in how they work, and I think we need to be pretty careful with the nuance on these things. Um, okay, next question. What a, what a privilege and an honor to get the insights today. I'm Anderson Sale from uh, the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command. I'm interested in uh, your thoughts on the next steps for uh, multi-domain operations as it relates to partner and coalition uh, and having a united front and how you do that going on the battlefield next and where we, uh, what your thoughts are on that. Okay, General Williams, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so my downtrace uh, commanders I just mentioned, um, Charlie Costanza in Fifth Corps, all the folks up here in the front row, we're doing that every single day. Um, we plan for and think through a multi-domain operation lens. Um, the things that Kirk King is doing in 10th double AMDC, we're learning a lot from the battlefield as well. So multi-domain operations, okay, what it, what it says in the, in, the, in the textbook, and it's migrating a lot to NATO. NATO is on this plan now um, to uh, be in this space with us and partner with us through all the different spectrum, from space to AI. So it's nascent. Uh, it's not as developed as it, as, it, as it can be and will be, but I'm optimistic, optimistic about it. But I will tell you, the, the little engines that I have as a USRAF commander are these commanders here, whether it be in the dirt with Steve, um, with the stuff that, uh, if you want to talk to John Rafferty up here, he can't talk about, about it on this forum here. But in terms of fires, Chris, let me pull way back out. So General Covoli is two efforts where he is trying to transform the alliance. The major engines, if you will, is through targeting and fires. And so across the alliance, in our armies or in our corps, down to our divisions, um, that is sort of the, uh, the common language that we are trying to develop, uh, that kind of capacity where any shooter can shoot for any nation and vice versa, right? So you heard Johnny talk about what's good for Norway is good for Sweden. That's the same sort of construct we're going to have to have in the multi-domain operations, whether it be in the information space, whether it be in the AI space, whatever space it needs to be in, all of us need to be interchangeable. We're not there yet. We will be. And uh, as the USER commander, I use these commanders here as, you know, you heard many of them reference Charlie earlier. You know, I told Charlie, look, you know, I gave him when he came in a bunch of stuff to do. I said, look, just be a good, a good brother and ally to the Corps down there and, and, the, and the forces. Charlie lives in a hotel. He is moving. He is all over the AOR helping, but also learning as much as he's helping. He has learned a lot from, because we don't have, all, you know, we don't have all the answers in the United States. It's going to require all of us to do this. And so 5th Corps or 56 or all the units that are in the room here are in that MDO space every single day and are thickening it over time. But I will tell you in NATO, it's still relatively nascent. Uh, and it's not quite mature as it is in um, uh, the U.S. forces. So we have many miles to go before we sleep. Johnny, I don't know if you got any thoughts on it. Just to expand, especially on the Intel portion, uh, the trust being able to share and uh, and uh, know what uh, what you have to keep close to your chest, but uh, but uh, just having methods and protocols to be able to share more information. That's uh, that's going to be key. Dara, unless you want to jump on it, I'll go to the next one. Cool, cool. Okay, next question. One of him. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, ma'am, good morning, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Colonel Brian Love, I'm the G3 for Intelligence Security Command, so you get a two for today from INSCOM. So the question is, what policies are the sticky wickets right now for NATO to be able to accelerate convergence? Is I've heard info sharing, is it targeting, is it planning? Because it seemed like a, there's a lot of effort at the mill level but what are the policies, though, that you would advise, whether Sweden, U.S., or NATO, to help accelerate this? What would the priority be? And beat Navy. Thank you. Good, Johnny. You want to try? Someone uh, had to say it. <laughs> okay. 
Do you want to jump on it? Uh, it's a, I, I didn't want the question from Brian. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I have no good answer to that. I, I have to think for a while. So help me. Yeah. Um, I think uh, as you think about phase zero with our plans, right, um, authorities more for secure in those early phase, right? Um, we're working on that. The boss is working on that really, really hard. Um, if you're in, <clears throat> we sat down with uh, Randy George, the chief, yesterday. We had a, my uh, Nordic brothers and um, the Baltics as well. There's no space, right? So how do you stop mass and momentum, get the, the depth you need to be able to? You, you saw uh, Johnny's very good graphic of deep, close rear. Well, if you're Estonia, if you ask our tourists over here, right, in Lithuania, there's not a whole lot of room. He needs this space. And a lot of that room's on the other side of the fence. And so we probably need more from that way. And General Cavoli's all over this. I'm, my, my boss is Andy Rowling's over here as well. They work that all the time. <clears throat> and then um, that would be probably the one that we need a little bit more. He needs more authority earlier as we go, as we get the indications and warnings. Uh, all these exercises that we do and we'll continue to do, um, and I'll back up a little bit more. The early fights, right, it'll be all of these frontline countries, they're nations. And not, not only is he fighting in a NATO construct, he's also fighting with his country. You know, Posse and Arturis, Eagles um, are all fighting Indrik Sorel up in Estonia. They're going to have to defend their country, right? So those, those early indications and warnings, it'll be a national fight, right? And then that transition to NATO, when we get Article 5, that's really hard stuff, really hard. And we talk about it, it comes up in every single exercise. I was just talking to Magic the other day and in Poland the same way. Everything east of the Vistula River, the Supreme Commander, I mean, all those different things have to be talked about. So I think it's just sets and reps. That's, I don't mean to reduce that to that, but it really is that. I really think the more we do it, the better we'll get. Um, the boss thinks about it all the time. Um, so I, I think that would be one thing off the top of my head is those authorities to be able to, to as an artilleryman, I want to kill them as far deep as I can, right? Uh, with these weapons we're going to bring over here in the future, we want him to wake up and get a missile sandwich, right, from, from, very, from very early on. But we're not authorized to do that given until certain things happen. So earlier authorities and policy to continue to help our policy manners get it. The military committee, I don't know much you know about NATO, but uh, can be a little cumbersome sometimes. Um, but all of these chiefs that are in here, Jan, uh, all of them on the front row here, work that all the time. That's their space. And they want it more, they want it faster, they want it earlier. Thank you. One thing I'd add is, um, you know, we, we need to learn from the Ukrainians and develop policies that, that continue to facilitate that exchange of information from them. Yeah. They are really at the, at the edge of this, and, and we can learn a lot from them if we can incorporate them into our training programs, such as, as we're doing, uh, where we can. So um, they're, they're really, I think, a huge repository of information for our war fighters and for people like me. I'm still dodging it. <laughs> okay, very good. In which, in which case, I, I might just add, like, when we look at uh, the future of operations, in order to be competitive with a kill chain today, you need a pretty significant amount of automation, certainly in processing. Um, and the challenge that comes with that is that while we would like to build some sort of cohesive system which is designed and static, the reality is between Enemy, enemy electronic warfare and how it evolves once the fight starts to the massive uplift in bandwidth which is going to be required the second you actually start operating. Uh, and then just the fact that no one can really afford to upgrade every radio in our forces at the same time in the same way. Um, we are going to be in a situation where we are all using a lot of different bearers with different capabilities and that's just the reality. Um, and if we're going to actually enable the automation of a lot of these processes within the alliance rather than just within individual nations, then we need to have much better structured language yeah. so that the text that comes out through this system when it gets handed over makes sense to the AI in the other system. Um, and so building that standardized set of terms so that there is a, essentially one signifier for every signified, right? This word means that thing. It doesn't mean three or four different things. 
Um, that is really important if we are going to have a competitive kill chain, because in this context, we're talking about facing an adversary that does own all of the pieces, which means that they can get after that problem more easily. Um, yeah, just one, I know you, one more or less. Um, the other thing is, um, and I know that uh, when, when um, Ron spends a lot of time in this space, for the U.S., you know, it's going to be an away game for us for a lot of it, right? We have forces there, but we got to get to the fight. And so movement, onward movement, through the ports I talked about and through the different nations, policies which allow us to move, do that quickly. Uh, General Reagan, if you have questions on that, we'll talk about that more later. But that's also in the policy lane because there's it, it's not as, you know, as easy as you think, moving from west to east or north to south or south to north, coming through over the Carpathian Mountains, uh, coming down through the north. So, you know, one last thing, uh, uh, I didn't mention this, but I have to talk about, I mentioned up front, we are a theater that's transforming in contact. But at, in the U.S. side, I'll put my, my uh, use wrath hat on, 310, I would invite you all to come. In January, we'll be down with Steve Carpenter's backyard transforming. It's one of the three brigades that's going through this transformative process. We actually brought them over through the summer. They came in through um, Norway, exited through Finland and all the way down and worked on how we move from west to east before they went back. But they'll fight with new kit, um, transforming 1.0 and then 2.0, 2CR on the next. And we, you know, we look forward to working with all of you all and all of our allies as we continue to transform. So that would be the other one, the policy, wherever the policy guy went would be movement, Easter movement, and getting permissions from sovereign nations to move in crisis. That's a little tricky sometimes, as you probably know. So, so uh, General Linfors was introduced to American football this week, and he clearly had a very good tactical coach because he has successfully run the clock down. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Les. please, please join me round of applause for this panel. Now, I need all you guys' help. We need to turn this room quickly, so I need everybody to leave out, uh, take your stuff with you, and thanks again for joining us here at A2.